Okay, welcome to the first of three animals lectures. Uh, we will then cover human body systems and then ecology after this point. So we're going to take a look at what makes up an animal and the first uh, several levels of phyla in the animal kingdom. So animals all must be heterotrophic, eukaryotic, and multicellular and lack cell walls. 95% of all animals in the world are invertebrates. They do not have a backbone. However, most, um, most of the ones that we think about as animals are vertebrates, but only 5% of the species on the planet in the animal kingdom are vertebrates themselves. There are a couple of different trends in animal evolution. Um, cell specialization is one of them creating in increasing levels of organization from cells to tissues to organs and organ systems, and also the development of um, cephalization or the development of a head end. So that, that is a trend that we see in the animal kingdom. So animals are all multicellular, heterotrophic. They are modal. That means that they move at some point in their lifestyle. Not all animals move at all points but they all move at some point. And they also show embryonic stages. Body symmetry is the way in which the parts of an animal or the body plan of an animal is arranged. Asymmetry means that there's no pattern. Uh, some sponges and very few corals are in this group. But generally, if I say asymmetrical, I want you to think sponges. Radial symmetry means that you're shaped like a wheel um, or like a pizza. You can cut it in any different plane and end up with two equal halves. And so radial symmetry ends up with just an oral and aboral end, so the part with the mouth and the part opposite of the mouth. And these are common in the nadaria, so the starfish, uh, or the hydra and the jellyfish, and starfish, the echinodermata, also have radial symmetry, but it was kind of a secondary regression. And then most of the critters are bilaterally symmetrical, which means that they have only one plane of symmetry and you end up with a left and a right side. Um, most bilaterally symmetric animals are also have cephalization, which means that they have um, the anterior end of their, of their bodies, which is where the head is, actually becomes to have a head. They, they concentrate the sense organs in that area. So the more complex the animal becomes, the more complex their cephalization uh, or the more pronounced cephalization happens there. So with um, animals that are bilaterally symmetrical, you get a couple of different directional terms that you'll need to know. Anterior means toward the head. Posterior means toward the, to the tail. Dorsal means the backside and ventral means the belly side. Some other animal trends is the development of a di uh, digestive system. The earliest or most primitive types of animals only digest by diffusion, either across their body wall or inside pores or whatever. Um, some of the animals, like the nodaria, the jellyfish, have a sac-like or incomplete digestion, um, which means that basically they take in food through the mouth and they expel waste through the same orifice, the mouth. So they take it in and spit it back out. A complete digestive system means that it goes one way. And starting with a certain type of, of phyla, and I'll tell you what that is during this lecture, you develop a complete digestive system, which means you have a mouth and an anus. So the food only goes one way through the system. And it's a little bit more um, efficient that way. Additionally, starting with uh, the segmented worms, you have the rise of segmentation, which leads to increased specialization and complexity. Advanced animals all have body segments and specialization of the t tissue. Even humans have segments. If you take a look at um, the spine or the ribs, you can see some remnants of the segments that we start out with in our embryology. Additionally, animals develop body cavities, um, which are fluid-filled spaces where the internal organs can be suspended. And starting with one particular group, you start with a true body cavity. We will not cover that group today. Um, it will start off the lecture for next week. 
So what I'd like you to do is to take a second and actually make this chart because this is going to be some pretty interesting stuff that we're going to cover and this is a chart that you're going to take notes on for um, for a long period of time over the next three lectures. So please take the time to make this chart on a separate piece of paper so that you can add to it as we go. Make sure you have the phylum, the symmetry type, the type of feeding, um, any unique characteristics, and I'll cover all this, evolutionary milestones, and some examples. All right, so we're going to start with the earliest type of true animal, and that's the periphera, the sponges. Periphera means it's got pores, and sponges have lots of pores. Sponges show their success in their simplicity. They have generally asymmetric or radially symmetric bodies. They don't have true tissues, and they don't have true organs. Um, they have two layers of body cells, and there's a semi-fluid matrix between them with spicules, which act to support them. So these spicules, they, they kind of look like jacks, where you play the old game where you bounce the ball and you grab the jacks. They kind of look like jacks. Um, they have some specialized types of cells called collar cells or coanocytes. These collar cells are related to certain types of protists. And so they think that the, the collar cells look like the coanoflagellates in the protist kingdom. And so that's where they think the, the dividing line is between the protists and the animals in this case. So these collar cells line the interior chambers. They beat their flagella and they move large amounts of water through the body pores and out through the large opening at the top. And you can see the large opening of three um, at the ends of these tubes that you see in this picture. They trap, uh, the collar cells or coanocytes trap suspended food particles in their collars and then transfer the food to another type of specialized cell called amoebocytes. And the amoebocytes look like amoebas. They actually move around using pseudopodia throughout the body. And the amoeba cells then move the food to where it needs to go. Now, sponges don't move. They do move when they're embryos, but they don't move as adults. And, and they can reproduce sexually or asexually. But because they don't move as adults, they have to protect themselves. And so in order to do that, what they do is they either have really sharp, spiky spicules to help protect them. Some of them are made out of glass, even. Um, and they can also produce really nasty chemical secretions to help protect their bodies. So sp sponges can reproduce sexually or asexually. If they are sexually reproducing, then what happens is the amoebocytes grab onto sperm as it swims into the body of the parent, and it, it actually f becomes like an egg and becomes fertilized and turns into an embryo, which then swims away. Um, but sponges can also produce um, buds, which are called gemmules, or they can reproduce by fragmentation similar to the way the fungi, uh, our fungi did. Okay, so that's the periphera. Now we're going to look at the stinging animals, the nidaria. These guys have simple tissues but still no organs. So that's their big evolutionary milestone is that they've developed tissues. Um, all nidarians are tentacled and radially symmetric animals. The group includes jellyfishes, sea anemones, and hydra. Nidarians have extremely simple body plans. Um, they have basically two forms. They have a medusa and a polyp. The medusa is, is bell on top, tentacles underneath like a jellyfish. And a polyp is just flip it upside down. And so you got bell on the bottom and tentacles out the top. So the medusa looks like an umbrella and floats along in the water. And the polyp is kind of more tube-like and is usually attached to something or can be part of a co colony. The digestive, col uh, the digestive cavity of nidarians is very, very simple. It's sac-like. 
and it has two layers of tissue, the epidermis and the gastrodermis. So the epidermis is the outside layer, and the gastrodermis is the layer that lines the, the digestive cavity. So one of the things that are characteristic to nadarians is that they use nematocysts. Nematocysts um, discharge similar to a harpoon. <coughs> and basically this harpoon will work whether the jellyfish is alive or dead. I'm going to use jellyfish as a generic term for this group. It'll work whether it's alive or dead. So basically, you touch this little trigger cell, the barbs come out, and they inject the venom. That's kind of how it works. Um, and so they work all the time just like that. Now, there's a lot of like urban legends about how you get rid of jellyfish stings. Some say put meat tenderizer on it. Some say put seawater on it. Some people say pee on it. Um, there's a lot of different things. And the thing is, is that with, depending on the species of jellyfish, some of those work and some of them will make it worse. And so if you always put meat tenderizer on it, for example, well, that'll work for some species, but it won't for others. And so it's kind of one of those things that you need to be aware of. Additionally, again, they can sting whether they're attached to the body or not. Um, I got stung across the eyeballs once by just a bit of tentacle that got splashed up with water that hit me in the face. Um, it was unpleasant, let's just put it that way. Like the plants, though, the nadarians actually show alternation of generations. They go from medusa to polyp and back to medusa again. Um, they, sometimes they just have the polyp stage, but most of them actually do alternate. Um, the medusa is usually the sexual form, and the polyp is, tends to be the asexually reproducing form. Many nadarians grow as colony, and sometimes they also harbor photoautotrophs as, as guests. So basically they'll harvest plant cells or algae cells inside their bodies to protect them, and they get that energy directly from there. It's a, an example of symbiosis. The flatworms are the next group, the next big group. There's, there's a whole bunch of little groups in between these guys, but the flatworms are the next big ones. Flatworms are called platyhelminthes, and platy just means flat, and helminth means worm. Um, these guys are the first ones to develop simple organ systems. Okay, so we move from no true tissues to basically almost like a colony to tissues in the nadarians, and now we've got simple organ systems in the flatworms. They also are the first ones to have three tissue layers. Remember, the nadarians had two. They had the gastrodermis and the ecto ectodermis. Um, in this case, they have three. They have a mesoderm, an ectoderm, and an endoderm. And all of the other groups of animals past the flatworms all have those same three layers, including us. So the body is flat. These are bilaterally symmetric animals. We're not talking radial symmetry anymore. Bilaterally symmetric. They're flat but they do not have a body cavity yet. Many species of this group are hermaphroditic, which means they have both sexes in one body. But generally, they practice cross-fertilization. They don't self-fertilize. There are three kinds of groups in the flatworms that are of interest. The planarians are the free-living ones. They're also called the turbolarians. They're free-living, they live in the water. Um, an example of a uh, free-living version would be the ones on the right, the very colorful ones. So in these guys, because they're free-living, that means that they actually go out and seek their food, and they have a, a sac-like gut, so we still don't have a complete digestive system. They have a mouth that attaches to a pharynx, which kind of extends out of their bodies and grabs onto something and sucks it in. They can reproduce sexually, but they can also reproduce asexually. These are the guys that if you cut them in half, you end up with two. 
The flukes are different. The flukes are the ones on the lower left in this picture. That's Clonorchis, sheep's liver fluke. And flukes are internal parasites. They are not free living at all. Um, they're internal par parasites that require um, intermediate hosts and then primary hosts. So they have a two-step host cycle. The intermediate host is, oddly enough, always a mollusk and usually a snail of some sort. And then it develops into a mature form which can then infect and become parasitic in the adult host. And the adult host is very often us. This is a, an interesting group um, and I'll talk about them more in a second, but, but flukes have caused lots of interesting damage over the time. And finally, the tapeworm group is a, it's also not free living. They're parasitic, internal parasites, and they tend to live in the intestines. And basically what they do is they don't have a pharynx, they don't really have a mouth. What they do is they just absorb nutrients that are passing through the intestines into their body wall and use, use that. But they have to be completely mature and ready to go by the time um, they infest a host. So all of the segments that you see on the tapeworm, and the head is down at the very bottom. It's that tiny little dot at the very end of the string. The tail is actually the fat part at the end. Because as the segments grow, um, they're called proglottids, and as they grow, they get develop and they get more and more eggs in there and fertilize. There are about 10,000 eggs per, per proglottid. And so each, a couple of proglottids are shed each day into the feces of the animal that, sh that can then get onto, for example, grass and then reinfect another animal. So they have both female and male organs because in the intestine of a host, there are no flatworm singles bars, and so they have to do their own thing. This group, because they're bilaterally symmetric, they also developed the first head. Okay, so cephalization first showed up in this group. So they are the first to have three tissue layers, they're the first to have basic organs, and they're the first to have a head end. So if you take a look here, we're looking at a generalized picture of a turbolarian, a, a flat, uh, a flatworm, uh, a free-living flatworm, or planarian, and if you take a look, there's a couple of different things that you need to be aware of. So the pharynx is H, that's the part that extends out of the body and sucks, into the, sucks in the food. The digestive organs are um, labeled as C, and the digestive organs, if you look at the previous picture, um, if you look at the fluke, you can see the digestive or organs as those dark, um, kind of granular looking things across the middle of the body. So the digestive organs are actually what you're going to see the most of. They have basic uh, eyes, which are labeled by F. They have a basic brain, which is labeled by E. And they have basic ears, called auricles, labeled by D. They're kind of cute. However, this group has created a lot of problems. Parasitic flatworms um, in the fluke group, which are called the trematodes, have oral suckers that are sometimes have hooks uh, to associated with it that can attach to their host. Um, so some of these flukes, like the liver fluke with clonorchus that I showed you before, or um, the blood fluke, which is schistosoma, can cause very serious diseases. So you take here, this is a picture of a liver of an animal that has the flukes inside of them. And you can see those, those round kind of circular encasements and that's where they live until they eventually kill the host. Tapeworms are a little bit different and tapeworms attach the inside of the, of the intestines. And there are tapeworms that infest human intestines, which are in the ten tenia um, genus. And these guys can reach lengths of up to 50 feet. Now, this is a true picture of a, an advertisement from the 19-teens saying, hey, you don't have to diet, you don't have to exercise, just take 
tapeworms and deliberately infest yourself with a parasite and they will take your they will take your food away um, well yes and no and there's still kind of legends that that people still do it like models sometimes infest themselves with tapeworms so that they can lose weight well that's all well and good but it causes massive nutritional deficits and eventually tapeworms can kill you so not really a good idea but as you can see the hey you don't have to diet and exercise ad campaigns for um, different medications I use that term very loosely but different medications have been around for over 100 years okay the roundworms and this is our last one the roundworms are the group nematoda and this group are bilaterally symmetric they have a head end they have cephalization they have a very slender tapered body and the digestive tract, this is the big evolutionary jump, the digestive tract is complete in this group. They're the first ones. So they have a mouth and they have an anus. They don't have a true body cavity yet. They have a false body ca cavity called a pseudocelum. But they do have a true digestive tract. And this particular worm that I'm showing you here is called Centaribdis elegans, the elegant slender worm. And this is a tiny microscopic little worm. It's about two millimeters in size. Um, not truly microscopic, but it's famous because its extreme simplicity, simplicity has created lots of opportunities for geneticists to use these in the lab. They live about 20 days. They live in a Petri dish. You don't have to feed them very much, and you can study them for a long period of time. So it's pretty interesting. You'll see these guys all over biological research if you bother to look. However, <clears throat> most roundworms are small and free-living, but some are extremely parasitic, and here are some examples. Trichinosis, which is in the upper left-hand side, um, is caused by consuming undercooked pork. This roundworm insists in the muscles of the host. However, sometimes, and I've, I've looked all over for the picture that I know is there, um, but I can't find it, trichinosis can also end up embedding into your brain tissue, and then it will kill you. So these little um, parasitic worm larvae that are sitting there in embedded in your muscles sometimes they get confused and get lost and they don't have on star so they end up in the brain and they form their little cysts and it kills you guinea worms um, over here on the top right guinea worms are very common they infect people by living under their skin and they must be extracted very very gently because if they're not pulled out properly they can go septic and kill the host and so basically what happens is this little tiny white worm makes a hole in the surface of the skin and most of most of the time what you do is you take the head it, actually it's the butt they breathe through their butt so you take the butt end and you take it and you wrap it on a little stick and then every day you roll the stick a little bit more to kind of roll it up like you're winding yarn um, until the point comes to where the guinea worm comes completely out of the out, out of the body. This is very common in uh, groups in Africa, areas in Africa, whereas the trichinella problem, the pork roundworm, is common all over the world. Anywhere where you eat pork, you can get this. And you can also get it from fish, it's just a different species. Pinworms, which are down here on the lower left, this is actually an endoscope of the rectum of a child. They're extremely common uh, parasites in, in children. And what they do, and it's pretty insidious, is that you eat them, you, you usually get them by eating slightly undercooked eggs or um, the pinworm eggs itself that have attached to something that you eat. So you, you end up ingesting it. And the adults live in your intestines but they know what time of day it is. I don't know how, but they do. They know what time of day it is. And so at night, they migrate down to the anus. And they have little tiny slender hairs on the tips of their heads that they poke into the surface of the anus and the rectum, which causes irritation and itching. Well, if, and, and they're laying their eggs as they're poking around. 
And so basically what happens is a child will end up reinfesting themselves because what they do is they scratch at night while they're asleep to make themselves feel better, and then they get up and eat breakfast without washing their hands. And so they end up reinfesting themselves over and over and over again. Um, and so they're, they can hang around for a long period of time. Loa loa is another type of roundworm, and you can see the arrow pointing to it. Loa loa is a blood-dwelling nematode that is parasitic. The adult wor worm wanders through tissue that's right under the skin, but it's most ob obvious when it crosses under the eyeball. The white of the eyeball, called the conjunctiva, they swim through that tissue. It's extremely painful and you can actually feel them going from one eyeball to the other across the surface of your skull. You can actually feel that. It's, it's horrible. Um, its common name is the African eye worm because that's generally where you diagnose it. But the king of all of them is the one called elephantiasis. And this is a roundworm infection. And basically you get this by drinking infested water, which has the roundworm eggs in it, they hatch and they go through your lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a tissue fluid system that removes fluid from your tissues and returns it back into your circulatory system toward the heart. Well, these roundworms like to hang out in those lymphatic vessels. And so basically they cause blockage. And so the tissue fluid can't return and it causes massive swelling, primarily of the legs and lower extremities um, by blocking that lymph flow. Sometimes you can also get this by mosquitoes feeding on you and de delivering the eggs as well. Okay, so that does it for Periphera through Nematoda. I promise not to show you too many other nasty, disgusting pictures of parasitic diseases after this lecture, but you did need to know about some of these because roundworms are one of the most common infections of people around the world, even in America. All right, have a lovely day. Make sure you try the practice quiz.